Um, the most expensive one and the most straightforward one is a brute force attack in which you try every possible key. There's only two to the 48 keys and it will take you a couple of weeks to months on the computer to try all of these. Um, it will be much faster if you invested some money into FPGA resources. So it's just a small FPGA cluster. You can be breaking these car keys, um, say, in a minute if you wanted to. Um, definitely worth an investment if you're in the business of stealing cars, I take it. More interesting, though, are attacks that exploit more the, the protocol or even the structure of this cipher. More interesting, certainly from, a, from an academic point of view, because we point out weaknesses beyond small key size. Everybody knows this is a weakness. Um, that we can learn from, but also more interesting from the attacker, of course, because these attacks are even cheaper than investing a few thousand dollars into FPGAs. Um, the one generic attack that is, that is possible against this protocol is a rainbow table pre-computation um, in which you compute a code book, basically a reverse mapping from what comes out of the cipher um, that you see and what, to what key went into it in the first place. There will be a talk today at five that goes a little deeper into this topic, so I won't touch on it too much now. Um, one much more interesting attack, though, um, that attacks the cipher itself is what we call algebraic attacks, um, an attack that, that exploits the, the nature of the cipher and tries to reverse it where this should not be possible. Apologies if this, uh, the next couple of slides are a little bit technical and theoretical. Um, we have been asked over and over, though, how we actually go about breaking crypto once we have it. And I want to answer this once and for all. And I want to answer it in what I think is the best possible way, by giving you a tool so you can go through this process again without understanding too much about the cryptography. So I'll, I'll be giving you just enough background so you, so you appreciate and understand how, how to use this tool. And then whenever you come across a cipher, um, you can break it. I'll also be explaining you how to spot weak cryptography, which is important if you do your own disassembling, for instance. Um, so one step back, though. Um, how do you generally break a cipher? Of course, a cipher is designed as a, as a mathematical function that you can go in one direction, say, from plain text to an encrypted text, but never go back unless you have some secret information, a secret key. So it's a street you can really go only in one direction in. Um, the way this is tried to be achieved in, um, in, in cryptography is through, through building up complexity in the way from the inputs, the secret key, to the outputs, what, say, an attacker would actually see, and try to pile up as much complexity as possible. I'll be explaining or defining a little bit more closely what complexity in this context means. But just uh, for your mental note, um, trying to, to throw as much mathematical complexity at it makes it more one way. Now, of course, this is, there's a trade-off between doing that and having it really cheap in hardware, for instance. Um, so designers will try to find the gold middle way uh, where it's still very cheap in hardware and perhaps software, um, yet piling up enough complexity for this to never be reversed. Now, I'll be, I'll be introducing a tool here that can actually reverse a whole group of ciphers. So this isn't a tool specific to high tech or any one cipher, but um, rather to, to a whole group of low complexity ciphers. Um, just for the computer science geeks in the room, um, we're, we're really talking about a, a, a PNP complete problem here, um, where if you are, if, if you are NP complete, you're definitely too expensive. When you're P, you're definitely too, too cheap to break. So this is the gold middle you need to strike. Um, and introducing yet another way of describing this. So we were saying linear, uh, we were saying uh, non-complex complex. And in cryptography, we would say linear and non-linear. Um, this promise, this will be the last concept I'm introducing here. Then it's more fun again. Um, a linear function is, say, the XOR of terms. If you have 10 things to play with, the longest possible XOR you can be compiling is of length 10. If you access any of the 10 in it again, it will cancel out at least one of them. So if you stay linear and you have n things to play with, you'll never get below, below, uh, beyond length 10, or n in this case. 
whereas if you use other functions, and, or, and so forth, and you're com combining, say, your A and B term into an A and B, and then X or those, you can get exponential. So with your N things to play with, you can uh, go up to two to the N lengths. And of course, I'm talking about the description of the cipher in the most generic form, right? Sorry if this was too theoretical, but it needs to be said once. So what we're doing here is describing ciphers in generic ways, describing the mapping from the secret key to the output in a way that the computer can understand and perhaps reverse. We are saying that linear is bad and nonlinear is, is good. Um, surprisingly so, though, all stream ciphers, even new ones that, that I come across in hardware, use what I call the linear feedback shift register. I'm sure you have seen those before as well. If, if you if you've ever looked into um, cryptography, those are very handy um, building blocks with nice mathematical properties, only they are completely linear. What these are doing is XORing numbers. So if this is of length and the equations that come out of it um, are at most n terms, x or terms. Is this understood by everybody? That if you only do x or you can't ever exceed a certain number because eventually things will cancel out again, right? Now, high tech, of course, uses this too, being a stream cipher and being a proprietary stream cipher. How could they not? Um, so high tech is highly vulnerable against reversing attacks. This, in fact, is the high tech cipher. Um, it does have a fairly large um, linear feedback shift register. It only has one, though. So there's 48 bits in this state down here. And they're exert over and over again with themselves, um, leading to exert terms in here in each of these cells of length at most 48. Right? What's being done then is kind of smart. It's, um, it's fed through a filter function that is very high, highly nonlinear, degree 20. So this would be, um, this would be hard to break if there were to feedback whatever comes out of this filter function into the state so that once it goes around and around and gets more and more and more complex, it piles up nonlinearity. Unfortunately, they, well, or fortunately for us, they forgot the one wire that would connect this back to here. And they don't build up this, this complexity, even though all the building blocks are here already. Um, alternatively, of course, um, they could just introduce some nonlinearity in the feedback. So instead of using a linear feedback shift register as, as this one, one could very well replace uh, one of these XORs with an AND or with an OR adding virtually no, co no cost to the hardware, not changing any of the mathematical properties, yet adding huge complexity in every round. This will go around here dozens of times, and in each round will accumulate complexity. Well, this is not being done, fortunately, for us. So we have a cipher here that's easily described with very low degree equations. Um, on this slide, the only number that's important is the four down here. Everything else is for reference. So we can describe this entire cipher with terms of degree four or less. Where really, if we have something 48 bits, we want to have terms up to 48, right? Otherwise, we, we waste the potential of the key size. Well, suffice it to say, um, this is at most degree four, so we can easily break it. Everything up to degree seven is almost trivial. Um, now let's get back to this tool I was, I was promising you. Um, there's a whole group of tools called the satisfiability solvers. They use